right, I finally read it. One of the most notorious books on book talk, bookstagram, booktube, and whatever the hell the Tumblr equivalent is. It ends with us from who I'm learning is apparently a very controversial author, Colleen Hoover. When I started posting about this on my Instagram and people started referring to her as Coho and the DMs were all negative, I knew we were getting into something here. And I'm sure I'll learn about all that stuff at some point, but I just wanted to go into this with just fresh opinions, no knowledge on who's behind the story. So I'm here and the results may shock you. It seems like a very interesting phenomenon in that the marketing for this book compared to what the subject matter is actually dealing with seems to be pissing people off more than what the book actually is is a lot of the time. And I get that, marketing absolutely affects how media is consumed. And there are absolutely parts of this that are ridiculous. You know, I got my little sticky note tabs going on here, but you guys gotta remember the type of books that I read for this channel, the track record that I have accumulated. We're talking Fifty Shades, Polish kidnapping smut, rebranded One Direction abuse fan fiction presented as sexy and romantic. By comparison, this book deserves awards for how well adjusted it is. Yes, it still feels like reading fan fiction Fiction. Yes, it feels entirely too much like a romance novel for the subject matter. Yes, it has issues, but hell, I have read worse. Though I have since stumbled upon an entire movement of people defending a full-on abuser in this novel, so that's always fun. For once, I am not mostly okay. And honestly, all these women and everyone else in the world could save themselves a lot of problems with today's sponsor, Adam and Eve. Because post-nut clarity is for everyone. With 24-7 customer service, discreet shipping, over 50 years of experience in the business and 90 day hassle-free returns, you can feel confident exploring with Adam and Eve. They also donate 20% of their profits to help fight the spread of HIV around the world so you can feel good about feeling good. So make sure to use code JEDI at adamandeve.com to get 50% off one item plus free shipping in the US and Canada. Some exclusions apply. But let's dive into the book, which is apparently getting a live action movie adaptation with Blake Lively in the lead position and people are not happy about that. And not because they don't love Blake Lively. People love Blake Lively and that's why they're trying to save her from this role. This is also wild. I don't know if I've ever seen people upset about casting in this way. Usually it's because they just don't want that person cast. I've never seen it as like a preservation thing. And for those who don't know, because I certainly didn't, It Ends With Us was actually published in 2016, but then just gained a lot of online attention sometime in 2020 and has maintained that popularity through the power of the internet. And I guess it's loosely based based on her mother's own journey of ending an abuse cycle with her father. Which makes some of the scenes in this a little bit awkward. Uh, there are definitely some steamy moments. This is kind of like smut light. And I do actually think that the story was a really important one to tell and that there's a lot of like really good passages dealing with it. I just don't know if it always handles it in the best way. And I don't know if you know that from the back of the book, which essentially just makes this sound like a classic love triangle of a first love reappearing in our main character's life to cause problems with her existing relationship that's also a little bit rocky because he doesn't like relationships. But spoiler alert, because we are going right on into this, this is a story about abuse. Our main character grew up in a home where her mom was being abused by her dad and then ends up in a situation where she ends up being abused. And that's an interesting angle to see someone who's always said, I am never gonna let that happen to me. That's never gonna be my life and put them in the situation where it's happening to them and the excuses and allowances they make because they genuinely love this person and want to see the best in them. That Users rarely start at 100% and sometimes they're the most loving, compassionate, and supportive people in your life, but it's that 10% that they're not that matter the most. And if you currently find yourself in that situation, whatever the degree may be, I will have resources linked down below. But the way this book is presented and plays out kind of affects that intention. For one, presenting it as a romance novel and having to keep that romance aspect at the forefront is a huge issue and undercuts a lot of what I feel the story should be going for. Because in a lot of ways, this is gateway smut. The story I got it at literally made a well out of the book, so it's like you read it and you fall into the well of potential smut. But I also realized that the romance aspect is one of, if not the main draw for this book. As much as it's a reason for people to hate the book, it's probably also why it's consistently performed so well. And I hear that this is a trend with Colleen's books, that they just kind of get progressively more messed up in these weird little ways while still being presented as romance novels, so I guess we'll see if I continue down this journey. And I don't think that approach is inherently wrong. You take a situation that so many of these different books set up, you get the hot guy with the dangerous edge, you build up a quirky non-traditional relationship start, and you as the reader either get swept up in that charm or infuriated that it's even working. But then it does what so many of those other books don't do. Instead of the abuse staying verbal or them just smashing things
things around the house when they're upset. The abuser in this does physically hurt the victim. And all that other stuff is just as concerning. Like if you're with someone who's punching holes in walls, like someday that could very easily be you. But when you're reading these books or watching the movies based on those stories, it's a lot easier to explain away that kind of behavior and not so much when someone's actually physically hurting someone. And that cycle of abuse is really the main focus throughout. The abuse she witnessed against her mom the day her dad accidentally hurt her too when she realized her mom was never gonna get them out, and her having to work through that in her own relationship. The book itself is incredibly easy to read. Like I said, it has a very polished fan fiction flow that makes it a breeze to get through. It doesn't waste time with unnecessary details to the point that the world feels quite empty. And like we're told it's taking place in Boston, but outside like a Bruins game happening, like it doesn't feel that way. And while I absolutely get and largely agree with the complaints about this book, it is easily one of the more enjoyable things I've had to read for this channel. Like, I'm sorry, some of the stuff I have to read is so long and bland and just overly drawn out and horrifically written. Like, that third after book is a nightmare. Dakota Johnson deserves an award for how she made Anastasia Steele's character someone who's actually bearable compared to that book. Like, some of that stuff is so bad that I have to physically read the book and listen to the audiobook just to keep me focused enough to finish. But I was done this in like eight hours tops. It does throw in a lot of awkward, cheesy dialogue that you expect to see in a fan fiction. Like it'll go from people behaving completely normal and believable to just dropping these weird poetic zingers like, if only my issues were as trivial as matters of the heart. And then some weird quirky stuff like, Ellen, I am confident that the next sentence I'm about to write has never been written or spoken aloud before. When he was wiping that cow shit on me, it was quite possibly the most turned on I have ever been. But let's hop in. Our protagonist's name is Lily Blossom Bloom. Parents clearly hated her, and the real tragedy is that she genuinely loves plants and flowers and opens her own florist shop. It's acknowledged that it's ridiculous in the book, but she also could have just, like, not done that. And immediately she meets Ryle Kincaid. When he storms onto the roof she's on and starts smashing patio chairs, she's gonna fall madly in love with him. And yes, that is Ryle, like Kyle, but with an R. And I hope that was specifically so I could make jokes like, <laughs> I sure bet he's gonna get her riled up. <laughs> Sorry. So they start sharing what's bothering them. For her, it's that her father died and she's kind of glad he's dead because he was abusive. And he's a training neurosurgeon that just dealt with a five-year-old being fatally shot by his younger brother. So rough days all around here, but at least them sharing these naked truths with each other. So these like unaltered, deep, dark thoughts and secrets. And you just know that it's gonna be a device they use throughout the rest of the novel, but then having like the framing that it's abusive, like you know specifically he's gonna use it as a way to like have some kind of control over her in situations where he's getting mad. But the first one she shares is that she would kind of secretly look forward to the nights that her dad would actually snap and hit her mom because he'd then overcorrect and they'd have like two perfect weeks afterwards. Then eventually she shares that she lost her virginity to a homeless guy as a teen, which sounds way worse than it is. They were both in high school and he was staying in an abandoned house behind her place because he was kicked out, but you gotta make those naked truths a little bit more spicy when you're sharing them. Which he then segues into a naked truth about wanting to fuck her. Very blatant, very upfront. He only does one night stands. He's completely career driven and doesn't want the distraction of a relationship. Specifically mentions that he has a little collection of people that he satisfies his needs with. And then they don't see each other for six months. What a wild and bold choice. But before that jump, the truth she shared leads her to reading her old high school journals, which are written as letters to Ellen DeGeneres because she felt that keeping a journal was tacky. But writing your journals in the form of letters to a celebrity, very classy. Is that based on reality? That is just such a random little thing that it feels like it has to be something she did herself and I like literally just can't decide if it's genius or dumb. It's just dumb. But I actually mostly enjoyed the journal entries, mainly because we're told that the dad ends up beating this person up and I just want to know what happened. So as a romance, all that stuff felt pretty interesting, not without some issues, like her being 15 and this kid just having turned 18, but he's fixating on when she's going to turn 16. So it briefly feels like he's more interested in when he can have sex with her, but they do actually have like a very genuine bond, but I've seen some people have a bigger issue with that than the abuse, which is dumb. I assume it was just a stray comment. I didn't deep dive, but who knows? And my favorite part is at the beginning of one of the journal entries, she makes the comment that people might like to see what Ellen's life is like outside the studio and that she can maybe do a segment called Ellen at Home. And honestly, we've learned very specifically that people do not give a shit about Ellen and her mansion. We absolutely do not want to see that. But at the start of that six month jump, she's just closed on the building she's gonna be turning into her flower shop. And magically, just as she's showing it to her mom, someone comes in looking for a job. And this person just happens to be Ryle's sister, spelt with two L's and 
one S. I'm sorry if your name is Alyssa spelled with two L's and one S, but it's just that combined with the Ryle. It's like the parents, they were just, they're being quirky. They're being quirky little weirdos. But Lily ends up twisting her ankle, which is how she realizes they're related. And while he's supposed to be giving her medical attention, he just slips in. He slowly traces his fingers from the tops of my toes down to my heel. I still very much want to fuck you. The romance, it's palpable. And again, he reaffirms that he doesn't date, offering less commitment than Christian Grey's idea of not dating. I'm certainly not making it a competition because the answer is neither, but this dude in particular, after reaffirming multiple times that he only wants the one night stand and she's told him no multiple times, just shows up at her place delirious from working a 48 hour shift after having knocked on every single door in her apartment building until he found her. To beg for sex, pathetically, continuously, in a way that's just genuinely insulting and yet she still caves. Never give in to the beg, especially when he's saying things like, please have sex with me. I want you so, so bad. And I swear, once you have sex with me, you'll never hear from me again. I promise. It's just so romantic. And she even gives him a good response here. Did you seriously just knock on 29 doors so you could tell me that the thought of me is making your life hell and I should have sex with you so that you'll never have to think of me again? Are you kidding me right now? But she still agrees. Literally the only reason why they don't end up doing it is because he falls asleep while she's in the shower. Girl, take a look at yourself. Like a one night stand would be fine, but this is just concerning. He remembered where you lived when you vaguely pointed out your rooftop from a different rooftop and then spent over an hour knocking on every single door until he found you so he could beg for sex? It's concerning and icky. He then has the audacity to get mad when she brings a not real date to his sister's birthday and literally carries her away to his bedroom, locks her inside it, forcibly kisses her and agrees to give a relationship a real go. And he gives my least favorite desperate, you make me want to be a better person cliche as they enter into this situation. But don't worry, she's just as cringe. Her response to him saying it's just gonna be a one-time thing. You say this will make it stop, but I'm warning you right now, Ryle, I'm like a drug. If you have sex with me tonight, it's only gonna make things worse for you. Which quite literally only gets worse when his reaction when they do finally have sex is, you warned me, you said one time with you wouldn't be enough. You said you were like a drug, but you failed to tell me you were the most addictive kind. Okay there, Edward Cullen, slow your row. Buddy hanging out in a tree with some grease so he can sneak in and watch Bella sleep isn't looking so bad right now, is it? <laughs> Okay, yeah, it is. And while the beautiful new romance with Ryle is budding, she continues to read through her old letters to Ellen and we learn all about that homeless kid, Atlas. And it was obviously way more than sex. They formed this deep bond. She did what she could to make sure he was eating and showering. They'd hang out and watch Ellen before her parents got home. They share their stories of abuse. He literally stops her from stabbing her dad one night. We learned that the tattoo of the open heart she has on her collarbone is something that he had whittled for her, which is super sweet, but there's something about the word whittle that I I find so funny. I'm gonna whittle you a heart out of an old piece of wood. And her time with him just genuinely makes her a better person. But the whole time you're just waiting for the shoe to drop that the dad has to find out. But then he ends up moving to Boston, his favorite city, because his uncle offered him a place to stay until he can graduate and join the military. Meaning he's either dead or somewhere in this very city with her. And sure enough, not long after this, thing with Ryle starts, he invites himself to a dinner with her mom and their waiter is Atlas. Always told her he loved cooking. And apparently he's actually the owner and the head chef. He just does a bit of all the odd jobs sometimes. So you know, he's like super down to earth and respectable owner guy. They obviously have an awkward interaction when he realizes she's with someone else, but apparently he is too. So she mostly just chooses to be happy that he's doing okay now. And honestly, I'm already on team Atlas. Those journal entries are very effective. And I know it's not realistic, but instantly I'm like, this is the guy. Like on the one hand, you got the guy who showed up unannounced and uninvited to your apartment to beg for sex. And on the other, you have the guy who you shared a deeply intimate adolescent connection with who still maintains the like bad boy trouble vibes. This is usually the character that people eat up. So imagine my shock to find out that people are rooting for Ryle. And my rooting for Atlas gets even more firm when Ryle slams her so hard she hits her face off a cabinet door. They were drinking. He accidentally grabbed the casserole out of the oven without a mitt. She giggles because of the mess they're gonna have to clean, but it's his surgery hand, so he gets pissed and shoves her. 
hard. And in an instant, her insides are just crashing down inside her. This seemingly perfect man, kind, driven neurosurgeon who's fun and caring has done the one thing she swore she'd never tolerate. Which immediately he starts apologizing for, saying it was a mistake, that he was just worried about his hand and that she was laughing, and then starts getting intimate with her, all while still apologizing. I feel icky, like if I genuinely push someone I love and like cause them harm, which is not what happened here, I don't believe it was an accident. The last thing I would do is try to be intimate with them, but it works. The next day she does say it made her question their relationship and that if it ever happens again, she's gone. But then he does the biggest red flag you can after already committing the biggest red flag of actually, you know, hurting her. He preemptively lies to his sister about what happened because she's visibly injured from hitting the cabinet. Tells everyone she slipped on olive oil, has a laugh about it without even running it by her first. And obviously she's just gonna go along with it because they're out to dinner and public at Atlas's restaurant again. Who knows what happened the second he sees her face in Ryle's hand. So he follows her into the bathroom to make sure she's okay, which Ryle sees and assumes that she's done something in like the two minutes she's been in there. And Atlas is on him, hitting with the full like, you ever touch her again, I'm cutting off your hand and feeding it to you. Which is when Ryle realizes that this is the Atlas, the guy she lost her virginity to. And even though that was like 10 years ago, he's jealous and assumes something's going on with them. But she calms him down, reaffirms that she wants to be with him and everything's perfect. Right? Well, Atlas comes by the flower shop to apologize and leave her with a gift he got her years ago, an autographed copy of Ellen's book, personalized to say, Atlas says, just keep swimming. Cause that was their thing as teenagers. They would tell themselves to just keep swimming like Dory. And even though she says that Ryle didn't hurt her, it was just an accident. He hides his phone number inside her phone in case she ever needs to escape. So that night she finishes reading the journals and we find out that her dad was the mayor of their town. And when he beat Atlas almost to death, everyone rejoiced over him saving his daughter from the homeless man, like just ignoring the fact that they both went to the same high school together. But what has her most upset after all these years is that he promised to come back for her when he felt his life was in order. So she ends up in Boston, the city that he said was the best in the world to find out that he built this life and restaurant and still never came to find her. But I guess that's just the way things work out and she has Ryle, the perfect guy. Right? Which then cuts to part two, four to five months-ish in the future. He's making good progress with his career. Her flower shop is booming and they've spontaneously decided to get married. And because Alyssa with two L's husband is rich and also Ryle's best friend, they pay for the whole family to fly to Vegas that night. And they get about six weeks of a happy marriage before everything goes to shit. She comes out of the shower to a room being torn apart because he apparently dropped her phone by accident, which made the cover come off, revealing Atlas's number. Which which I think is bullshit for one, why were you holding her phone at all and either you snooped and then legit dropped it or you took it apart on purpose. He then calls the number instead of waiting to ask about it, realizes it's Atlas and starts destroying the apartment after fully smashing the phone. All without speaking a single word to her. Super well adjusted. So he goes to leave, she tries to get him to stop so she can explain and then he pushes her down the stairs, like the apartment stairs. And then she wakes up in bed with him trying to tell her that she she fell. Sir, please, are you joking? And as she's dealing with her immense pain, he's just begging her to know if anything was going on with Atlas that he can't bear it. As if she'd store the phone number of her affair partner that way. Like, what? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. She does the right thing and kicks his ass out. But then he just like sleeps right outside the apartment door all night. No! Stop that! If I had the hat, I'd wear it again. He then just shows up at her work where he's apparently actually told Alyssa mostly what happened this time, who again is now Lily's best friend. But even she's shocked when she actually sees Lily's face. But then she begs Lily to hear him out. Cause apparently there's a reason he gets so angry. I hate it, I hate it. So she agrees to hear him out. Apparently when they were kids, he accidentally shot and killed his older brother, which is why he was so particularly pissed off about having to deal with the same situation the night they first met. And ever since when he gets really angry, angry, he just blacks out. Okay, honestly, to me, that's just more of a reason to stay away. Oh, you black out and go into fits of rage where you don't realize you're causing someone serious bodily harm? Yeah, bye. Like he says he went to therapy, but clearly it wasn't enough and should still be happening. But also, I don't really believe the whole blackout thing because it kind of makes his abuse seem like an on-off switch. 
Like he's completely fine until he's just overwhelmed and this monster comes out and it should just be a source of pity towards him. But it is really just an escalation of his pattern behavior. He's always jealous, he's obsessive, and the abusive behavior is how he expresses it. He tries to say that that situation isn't an excuse for his actions, it's just a reality he has to deal with. But it sure as hell sounds like an excuse if you're not doing anything about it. And if it is actually a genuine reality that can't be changed, then you don't get to have intimate relationships with people you could hurt. And like, I guess that's why people are like, oh no, he deserves a redemption arc. No, no. He's an adult. He has to learn how to be better and stay away from people until he gets there. And again, he can just do that elsewhere. Like, we do not need to be rooting for a redemption arc with our lead. Because that's not the story we're telling. But she gives him another chance. Like, look, yeah, okay, the first time, I get that you let one slide. But he pushed you down the stairs and then tried to convince you that you fell by yourself. At this point, I'm just waiting for him to find the personalized Ellen book. The tension, it is tangible. Ugh, okay, continuing on. They come up with a solution that any time he gets frustrated, he'll leave the situation and she won't push him to continue the conversation. And he ends it all off with, help me, Lily, he whispers. I need you to help me. Ugh, I hate it when abusers put the responsibility of betterment and repair on their victims. Help yourself, shitbag. She even tries tying it into her wedding vows, like the for better or for worse, but like bestie, even that has limits. And as expected, we get about 18 pages of peace before it falls apart again. He buys him an apartment in the same building his sister lives in, so fancy rich place. Her business is one of the top 10 new businesses in Boston. He got selected for a specialized training program in Cambridge. And Alyssa, with two L's, is having her baby. All is super well until he leaves the hospital early so he can get some sleep and snoops through all of her stuff. He's been drinking, starts quizzing her on naked truths about this better in Boston magnet she has, wanting to know who gave it to her because it was Atlas, then gets her to start reading the news article only to find that Atlas's restaurant also made the list. And that Bibbs, the restaurant's name, stands for better in in Boston. Which would have been enough for Rob to lose it because he sucks, but the article specifies that it's an homage to someone who had a huge impact on his life. So she's trying to get out of the situation and get him to walk off before she notices that he read all of her journals. So he knows that Atlas gave her that magnet when they were teenagers and thinks that they're having this super secret relationship. But when she runs a super successful business that his sister works at, and then she just waits for him to get home, and then she also makes sure that all of her days off line up with his days off. I've seen some people say, well, if she had just told him who gave her the magnet, maybe it wouldn't have happened. But no, she felt like she had to lie to him so that he wouldn't hit her. It's self-preservation. And instead of going right in for an attack, he goes for SA, which is like the nice YouTube way of putting it. I'm not angry, Lily, he says, his voice disturbingly calm now. I just think I haven't proved to you how much I love you. Ew, ick, ick, oh my god, no. She's literally having flashbacks to the night her dad almost did that to her mom, which was also the night she almost stabbed her dad. He even bites her so hard where the tattoo is because he now knows what its inspiration was that it breaks the skin. So she bites his tongue and he headbutts her so hard that it knocks her out, then wakes up to him just apologizing over and over again. So she has to wait until he falls asleep to have Atlas come sneak her out to a hospital for stitches. And she specifies not the one that Ryle works at and I thought it was so that he wouldn't find her, but it's so that he doesn't lose his job. But you know what? I'm thinking, great, this is an awkward situation situation that's gonna have a lot of emotions in the fallout, but you're out. So obviously she's pregnant. I wish this was alcohol. I have never been more upset reading a book that is probably a lie, but this is certainly up there. Anytime any of these stories introduce babies, I'm like, no! And she wants to keep it! Which is fine, she gets to make that choice. But all my thoughts are like, you are trapped, connected to this abuser forever. And right when you think she's gonna start justifying the abuse again and what her responsibility is in it and the love she feels it thankfully ends off with her saying literally fuck that shit. But there were still 80 pages left in this bitch for it to disappoint me. And it comes pretty fast. Thankfully, this all lined up when he was going to Cambridge for three months, but she lies to Alyssa with two L's about what happened, so no one other than Atlas knows what Ryle did to her or that she's pregnant. And she just goes back to her apartment and pretends everything is normal. Like, she left Atlas's after she realizes he lied about having a girlfriend, so it's made her emotions too complicated to deal with. Because she admits that had she known he was single that night she first ran into him, she probably would have gone to him and let Ryle go. Girl, messy. But apparently he did go to find her once he got out of the military, tracked her down at university, but saw she had a boyfriend and assumed she'd still be better off without him. So we did another tour of the military. When you'd rather risk your life than just say hi. So he takes her back and basically says, if you need help, you can find me, but I can't do anything casual. And if you're ever ready to love again, 
you can find me. And in a regular romance book, that's fine, that's great. But I feel like we're now juggling like an old love with a new love that is abusive and getting out of that latter situation should be the focus. Like she doesn't even need a potential love interest in this kind of story. So it obviously comes out that she hasn't been speaking to Ryle. So she tells Alyssa everything. And she's like, as your best friend, if you take him back, I'll never speak to you again. So she starts her new reality of ending things, fills her mother in on what happened, gets her support in order, which is obviously when Ryle comes back a few weeks early. And this is apparently where a lot of people start to feel sympathetic for him and where they start kind of falling for him. Like I get why she'd have a hard time with her emotions about him, but I'm like, don't touch her, you sick fuck. Thankfully, that's mostly become her energy. Like she's literally traumatized. She can't get past that night and what happened anytime he tries to get near her. But then she just lets him be around all the time. Like when it's getting closer to her delivery date, he's sleeping on her couch to help her. Like how could you even relax? At one point she even has the thought that she's like her father because she said something to Ryle specifically to make him hurt. But like dude's still trying to weasel his way in. He's got to know how much he fucked up. And like what she said was completely fair. I wish this baby wasn't yours, Ryle. With everything that I am, I wish this baby was not a part of you. But it's literally not until after she's given birth and they're in the delivery room that she's like, yeah, I want a divorce, which could have gone terribly wrong. She does it while he's holding the baby. And she has to frame it out like, what would you do if our daughter came to you and said someone was doing the things to her that you did to me? And he has no choice but to admit that he'd tell her to leave. And that's where the title comes in. It's not her saying it to him, it's her saying it to her daughter. This cycle of abuse ends with them. She won't put her daughter through what she went through. And in all this, there's some like really great lines about why it's so hard to leave an abusive partner and like the love that plays into that, the guilt that plays into that and how it makes you feel about yourself. And it could have ended there, but of course we get epilogue where he's allowed having unsupervised visits with the baby. Yeah, there are abusive people who never hurt their children, but if he's gonna stick out to the I get frustrated and black out story, how does he know he won't get pissed and hurt his kid? Lily's dad hurt her once. He also doesn't really seem like the type of guy who'd be great at co-parenting and definitely seems like the type of guy who would continue trying to get in a relationship with Lily because their lives are just super attached. His sister is her best friend and employee. His sister's husband is his best friend. It just wraps up too cleanly. But hey, apparently they're making it worse. And one of those days she's bringing the kid to him, she runs into Atlas. So instead of this book ending with the triumph of her closing off the cycle of abuse and standing up for herself, it ends with her running back to Atlas saying that she's ready, which is obviously what was gonna happen. And I do like them together. It's just with the context of the book, like, you know. And then they just have to end it off with this totally cheeseball, unrealistic, poetic line of, you can stop swimming now, Lily. We finally reached the shore. Ugh! And hey, I bet Ryle's gonna be a real adjusted individual when he finds out she's dating again. Bet he's gonna be totally fine with the fact that it's Atlas. But still, despite all that, she is not with the abuser. She gets a version of a happy ending. This is leaps and bounds better than other things I've had to read for this channel. So imagine my horror to find out that there were Ryle's stance. I get the desire to fix broken people, but you know, maybe not the people that are gonna break you in return, whether that be physically, mentally, or emotionally. Cause it's always gonna end up being some combination of them all. But hey, book's done, Colleen said her piece. What can they do about it now? Oh no. So that is going to do it for today's video. If you feel like it jumped around a lot, it's because so much of this book is really just her reading those old journal entries. The major plot progressions are really just covered quickly at the beginning of chapters after those big time jumps. And if you've read the book, let me know what you think. Despite all the many negative reviews, I have heard that this is one of her better books. So like, should I keep going? I think I am definitely going to do the sequel at this point, but are there like other ones that I should check out? But like, what are they even going to do? Is it just going to be like her in a relationship with Atlas and Ryle actually like freaking out about? It. Is she gonna redeem him? I really hope not. No spoilers, please. I will get there on my own and in my own misery. Without having read the sequel, my main takeaway is that it's just an obvious cash grab for everyone involved, which fair. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. All of my social medias are linked down below and leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope we're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.